Ghost Hunting in New England, your favorite spooky podcast. Hello and happy Wednesday. Welcome to this week's episode of Ghost Hunting in New England with your hosts, Amelia and Beth. And today we have such a super special guest with us. He was on our very first episode of Ghost Hunting in New England. We've talked to him many times. We've investigated with him. We always like having him around. Barry Corbett, lead investigator of Boston Paranormal Investigators, is here. Welcome, Barry. Thanks, Amelia and Beth. Great to see you both. It's good to see you, too. Thanks yeah. for coming and joining us. I've been listening to all your podcasts, so I'm all caught up. Thank you so much. That makes two of you. <laughs> <laughs> so Barry and I had the distinct pleasure of, or I should say, I had the distinct pleasure of going with Barry and BPI to investigate Wasagusset, which we talked about last season on our episode, Haunted Areas of the South Shore. Oh, yeah. uh, haunted Houses of the South Shore. But yep, haunted, haunted Houses of the South Shore. Mm -hmm. So we went out there. Um, we did a little investigating. And Barry, do you want to kind of tell our listeners how it all went? Yeah, it turned out to be a pretty interesting evening. Uh, I had actually never heard of that site until you had covered it on your show. But it actually, it factors pretty heavily into the history of dealings with the Native Americans down at the South Shore and uh, some of the four or five other sites that we've investigated. So it was really fascinating once we started digging into the history of it and going down to investigate. So it was a uh, cool November night, right? Mm -hmm. It was almost... Almost raining, but not quite there yet. But it was definitely cool. Yeah. And it's it's not a large area. It's kind of a small public park, but it's somewhat heavily wooded. They, they didn't mow the lawn very well. And once you walked in about 20 feet from the street, you felt like you're in the middle of the woods. It was yes. a very scary place to go and hang out when you were a little kid. Yeah. Even in the yeah, daylight. It, <laughs> it was. Well, and when you see it now, it's it's all cleaned up and there's that cleared area and like you can actually see into it. But when I was a kid there, you like there were just logs everywhere. Trees would fall in there and they wouldn't clean anything up. So um it, it looks a lot nicer now, but it looked very scary, especially to a little kid. This yeah, little kid. See that. So should we back up and do a little bit of the history of the yes. place? Yes. I would love you to tell us all about it, Barry. It factors in heavily with the colony at Plymouth as well as Wessagusset. The first uh, ship sailed there in 1622, financed by Thomas Weston. Two vessels sailed in the Charity and the Swan. Only 60 settlers come from London with the intention to, to land a, and plant a colony there. So they sailed up the um, Weymouth River and tried to establish the site at Wessagusset. One of the ships returned to England, and the Swan remained moored in Weymouth River. Before winter even began, they started running out of supplies. They, they hadn't fully prepared for New England winters. They didn't know how to plant corn. They didn't bring enough supplies, so they were in trouble right away. But they had already begun trading with uh, the native tribes at the time, which in that area was the Massachusetts tribe. And they got along very well with them initially. It was just like Plymouth Colony. They helped them out. They showed them how to plant maize, and they had very good relations initially. But after a while, when things got tough, the colony got desperate. And so they started uh, raiding the supplies of the Massachusetts tribe, and there was uh, hostilities going back and forth. And what happened was the natives accused one of the colonists of stealing from them. Colonists offered to um, offered that man up to be uh, judged by the native tribes, but they decided to hand him back, and the colonists actually hung him themselves. So they thought that would go a long way towards... Um, solving the relations between the two groups, but things had gotten worse, and there were more incidents where they were robbing the tribe. So they, one of the um, colonists took a trip down to Plymouth Colony, Phineas Pratt, I think his name was, and he gave reports to Governor Bradford that things were really bad there, that there's uh, the native tribes are causing trouble. Bradford's, the native tribes are causing trouble when we try and steal their food. There. Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> They're putting yeah. our people on trial and returning them with a slap on the wrist, and then we have to murder them. All oh, those native tribes, they're so troublesome. <laughs> so to his credit, Governor Bradford didn't take it too seriously. He told them, on, by no means, go and attack those villages. You'll be charged if you do. A couple of months later, he sent uh, Miles Standish with eight men up to see if they could negotiate with the native 
chief, I forget what his name was. So what happened is Stanish invited them into the palisade and he got the, the chief and two of his men into one of the buildings. And in the middle of negotiations, they just outright attacked and killed the three of them. They then left the building, went out and hunted down the rest of his men, killed them. They mutilated the bodies. They uh, took their heads off. They went down uh, to the local village and they murdered one of their own men who had married into the tribe, who had actually had a family with one of the uh, Massachusetts women. They murdered them, seven people all in all. They beheaded the bodies and they took the head back down to Plymouth, mounted it on a pike and took a cloth, soaked it in the victim's blood and hung it on a pole for all to see for a couple of months. This was actually the beginning of, uh, of the relations that for 50 years got worse and worse until it resulted in uh, King Philip's War. The paranormal activity reported there uh, is a result of that violence. And what happened is two or three hundred years later, they were developing the land and they dug up the bodies. They didn't know what had happened. They dug up seven bodies without heads. And then uh, a little bit further away, 50 yards away, they found the heads. They began looking into the history, researching what happened. You know, they found out about the incident. The park was originally dedicated to the colony itself, the original governor, Miles Standish, and all those people. But the heads were found on Bicknell Road, and that's where we get the reports of activity in the homes. Uh, people are seeing the spirit of a giant Native American walking through their backyards in their homes. They hear voices, disembodied voices, rapping sounds, shadow figures. So they tried to appease these spirits in some way. They decided, I think it was in 2000, they rededicated the park. They took down Miles Standish's name off the post. And they wrote a tribute to the actual Massachusetts tribe that lived there at the time. And they joined, they, they invited the Wampanoag and the uh, Narragansett and some of the other, maybe the uh, Nipmucks, to join in the ceremony. I don't know if it helped, really. I think they're still getting reports in the area. So we decided to get down there with our equipment and see if we could find anything for ourselves. What do you think, Amelia? I think the night started slow. It started slow. And it was very cold. but. As we went and we kept going and we kind of moved places, all of a sudden we heard this very strange noise and it was an animal and it really scared me a lot. <laughs> I was, I kept being like, I don't like, I, this doesn't feel right. Like, I think we should go. Like, it sounds like it's getting closer. And Barry's like, what's wrong with you? It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> You're like 20 yards from the street. <laughs> <laughs> like, no one's going to attack you. We're in Weymouth. Like, <laughs> like, I was like, it was I eerie, don't. Eerie, so. It was eerie. It was That was it. I was like, I feel like I felt like it was kind of connected. I was like, I feel like something doesn't want us there. And I have the recording that you sent me, Barry, right here. I'm just going to play it. Oh, get the thermal camera. Maybe we can get it. <laughs> That'd be awesome. David, are you still here? So, Beth, did you hear that that weird noise in the background? It sounds like a bird or something. Or It was a owl. It was a screech owl. And the thing about screech owls, which is very, very, very interesting, and we, we've kind of touched on this before in the show, but in a lot of Native American cultures, the screech owl represents warriors. It represents deceased warriors, spirits. And a lot of Native Americans had these very enriched superstitions regarding the owl. So much so that depending on where they would hear an owl, if they were going to battle, they would sometimes retreat depending what side of them it was on, thinking that that would indicate how the battle was going to go. So I thought, isn't this amazing that we're at this place and we're like digging around talking and all of a sudden this owl is right on us <laughs> screeching. And I love owls. I'm a big owl fan. Um, but it, it, it was, it was so haunting and so bizarre. And I, I really do believe with everything in me, it was like a spirit calling out to us. Well, that's what a lot of those tribes believe that the, the screech owl is actually the spirit of a dead ancestor. Yeah. Sent to protect you or give you messages or watch over you. But it started out subtle. You could just barely hear it, but it kept getting closer and closer. And what we were doing at the time was um, 
If your listeners have heard of the Estes method, we're doing a, a spirit box session where the sitter will put a blindfold on with headphones and listen to the spirit box. The spirit box sweeps between radio stations. And what you hope to get is disembodied voices that aren't related to the stations. So stations go by too quickly for you to catch more than a blip or one word here or there and it's cut off. But every now and then, you can get a full sentence, a few words, and you can tell the difference between a radio station and a human voice. And the thing with the essence method is the sitter can't hear the questions because the headphones are blocking. So we'll ask a question. Uh, Michelle was using the headphones. She doesn't know what we're saying, what we're asking. And if the answers relate to the questions, then maybe you have something. Maybe you've got a conversation going. And what she reported that night later on, this, this was going on while the owl started uh, voicing in distance. And it started getting closer and closer, louder and louder. We, she told us she heard two male voices and one female. And one, they both, the male voices had British accents, which is pretty interesting, as it was an English colony originally. She got the name David. I think there was another name, but I can't remember what it was. She never got the woman's name. But when we started worrying about this critter out there, one of us said, I think we should leave. That was me. I was the one it? saying, I think we should leave. That was me. He said, I think we're perfectly safe here. And then Michelle, who's listening to the spirit box, just says, no. <laughs> it's like we're being warned to get out of there. Yeah. <laughs> that was great. And so we kept asking questions, trying to get answers. And then at some point, the birds felt like it was right on top of us at one point. Yeah. I said, uh, you know, we're going to leave soon. Don't worry. We're, just, we're almost done here. And that's when the birds stopped hooting out at us. <laughs> completely. <laughs> completely stopped. So maybe really? there's something to that. Mm. Yeah, we did get, also we had the REM pod set up. The REM pod radiates its own electromagnetic magnetic field, and if anything comes within a couple of feet of it, it will sound off uh, a chime and light, two or three lights, depending on how close the object is. The person it has to be a person, someone with an electrical charge to set it off. It did go off twice that night. I thought it was the battery, so I went over to check it, and it, it stopped just before I got near it, so I let it just, so maybe there was somebody there, and uh, you guys had some impressions too, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. The owl was the big thing for me. I really, I mean, that was such a cool experience. I kept getting um, like really bad cold spots and then hot spots. And I don't usually get hot spots. So that was kind of neat. But just a lot of feeling of like being watched, a lot of feeling of like we shouldn't be there. That was like my biggest kind of takeaway was like I was so nervous in a way like you know, you go into like a haunted house or something and you get like the heebie-jeebies, but this was like a very different it feeling. Yeah. Right. It, it was like a different, it wasn't like I'm worried a ghost is going to jump out of me. It was just like, and maybe it was just because I was so freaked out by that owl. <laughs> I just, it was like really like, oh my gosh, but we had fun. I, I will never forget when that REM pod was going like crazy. And I remember you very being like, oh, it's just the batteries. Like it never goes off like that. And literally he walked over and he's like, about to reach down and grab it, and it just stops. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, it turned out to be an interesting night. Yeah, for sure. And we we weren't out there that long, so to get like that much stuff happening, we were only out there a couple hours, if that. Uh, yeah, it started raining. We had a we had a call quits early. Didn't want to ruin the cameras. It was a lot of fun, and thank you for letting me tag along because that was that was great. That was that was fun, and I really. I, I know I keep going back to this. Everyone listening is probably like, Amelia, we get it about the owl. But like to be researching a place haunted by a Native American tribe on Native American land and to have these symbols come up that was so prominent in their culture and something they so believed in. And that's the messages we start getting. That's unbelievable. That's an experience I will not soon forget. Yeah, that was a great night. What What's interesting is the history of that place is related to all these other sites we've been down there to explore south of Boston. We have um, Smith's Castle in Rhode Island. We have Anawan Rock down in Rehoboth. Deer Island in Winthrop and the Great Swamp Massacre, which is uh, North Kingstown. They all relate to King Philip's War, and they all relate to the history of Plymouth Colony and the, uh, the, two, the Pico War and the King Philip's War. These events from Wessagusset was 1621. There was 50 more years before King Philip's War broke out. But the group that was started by, uh, Mass not Massasoit, he was the chief that actually uh, befriended the pilgrims originally. 
he had sent in um Squanto because Squanto spoke English. He had been he had actually been captured in, in an earlier um, raid, brought to traded to Spain, and was ended up in the hands of some Spanish monks who taught him to speak and read English. He then was freed, traveled to London, then when, when he back home to his native tribe, he'd found they were all wiped out by, uh, mostly by disease, not by the wars. So he joined with Massasoit and the Wampanoag tribe, and he turned out to be very useful when they approached the Plymouth colony. He was able to walk right into the compound and, and say, welcome Englishmen. <laughs> they were shocked to see one of the braves speaking their language, and it helped uh, to establish relations. Yeah, it's all just incredible. Yeah, it's all interrelated. And Squanto was instrumental in the war, too. When the colonists began to grab more and more land, and as they struggled to, to survive the, the terrible winters, uh, initially the relations were so good between the, the tribes and the colonists, but because of these stresses and strains, uh, they got worse and worse. The uh, Wampanoag reached out a number of times, but the colonists became more and more paranoid. And this incident in West Augusta is one of the things that, that started it all. And it's kind of Miles Standish seems to be the one that was the culprit to me that started all this. And he was also very uh, aggressive toward the, um, the Wampanoags and the Narragansett in that area. The war was started over the death of uh, Massasoit's son. I think uh, Alexander was his English name, but he was Wemsutta. He was the oldest son, took over when Massasoit died. Wemsutta was killed by the colonists. And they were, there was another incident where... Uh, they had sent a warning to Squanto because he was spreading stories that the Indians were massing together, different tribes, to form a revolt, which at the time wasn't really true. They were unhappy, but they weren't planning any attacks or anything. They had sent a message to Squanto. It was a uh, arrows wrapped in a snake skin, a rattlesnake skin. It was meant to be a private message to Squanto as a warning, but he played it up as a threat against the entire colony, and that led to escalation. And then when Massasoit died, when Sutter took over, he was killed by the colonists. And uh, the, the second son was Metacomet, also known as King Philip. That was his English, English name, his Christian name. He was so angered by the death of his older brother that he actually began actually assembling the other tribes, raiding around the areas. And this is how the war began. Now, the other site I mentioned was um, Smith's Castle in Rhode Island. And that's where Roger Williams... Uh, actually one of the first governors of founded Providence. It was his trading post originally. And then it became a fortification and a plantation, but it was a meeting place. And this is where they assembled when the colonies uh, joined forces. At the middle, of, they would join, try to do a preemptive strike because they thought the natives were massing for battle. So they, the three colonies joined together. They met at Smith's Castle. They marched over to um, the site of the Swamp War, which is in uh, North Kingstown. It was a Narragansett village who had been harboring some of the Wampanoag warriors. They were still peaceful. The uh, Narragansett were actually uh, neutral at this point. They did not want a war. But they could see what was happening to the Wampanoag, so they were they were happy to shelter some of them. And But the, the palisade was mostly full of women and children and a few Wampanoag braves. So the group that met at Smith's Castle came over there and massacred 300 of them and just about wiped out the Narragansett tribe. This was in the middle of winter. They all fled out into the swamp, most of them froze to death, and the rest of them had to uh, just flee and try to find their way to other tribes. That was all interrelated with the violence of King Philip's War uh, caused by Metacomet. The other site was Anawan Rock, which we've been to a number of times down in Rehoboth, and that's where um, Metacomet's war chief, Anawan, was captured and finally ended the war. They were already in dire straits at this point. They were being hunted down. They were hungry and out of supplies. There was about 40 braves left, and uh, Benjamin Church took six men down, but he didn't know how many were there. He only knew that Anawan was camped there. If you've seen Anawan Rock, it's about a 60-foot outcropping. It has a sheer side that looks like a cliff, and the other side is kind of just a, a slight hill. He and his men, in the middle of the night, sneaked up the hill, came down the, the steep side, and separated Anawan from his warriors, got them to surrender, even though there was only six of them, 40 of them, of the... Uh, Wampanoag Braves. So that actually pretty much ended the war. Wow. Yeah. So I, I find it so fascinating. All these sites are, are related historically. And the more we mm -hmm. investigate all these areas, the more we learn about history, because we always dig in, we do a little research every time we go to a haunted place. Mm -hmm. And the more we uncover, the more interesting it becomes to me. Yeah, for sure. That's always one of like the best parts when you can dive into the history of these haunted places. Yeah. Even all of a house where uh, you guys have been to, um, 
in Middleborough. That was once owned by Metacomet. That was they would spend their uh, summers up there and their winter or the other way around. Their winters up in Plymouth and summers down at Manomet area. When game became scarce, he sold the land, decided the land wasn't valuable anymore. They traded it, sold it to the uh, Oliver estate. They built an iron factory or something. I think they were making wow. weapons, shovels. And, um, of course, that place is greatly haunted. They, Native American spirits are seen there once in a while. I think yes. Christie Parish herself has seen a Native American walking through the, the kitchen at Oliver House. I believe, she, I believe she's seen him somewhere on the property. Yeah, that, that sounds about right. Um, I remember I went there. I've been there a few times. The one time I went with you guys and, um, it was, it was fascinating. I think that was the first time I went. Um, I tagged along with BPI. So always fascinating. And you're right. I mean, everything is interconnected in, in especially like this area of the country. It's so history rich. So it's always fascinating to look into it more and more. Another haunted site in Winthrop. Have you heard of Deer Island? We have heard of Deer Island. Yeah. It's, it's now a water treatment facility. Before that, it, there was a prison there. Before that, it was an actual island. They've actually connected it with a bridge to the mainland. But at the end of King Philip's War, the braves they had captured, they isolated them on that island, left them there, where they assumed they'd be able to survive and plant corn and uh, take care of themselves, but they couldn't. It wouldn't grow there. They ended up uh, freezing to death, dying. There's about 100 Wampanoag warriors buried on that island. Well, that's horrible. Uh, grave sites. And then again, in the 1850s, it was also used as a hospital for um, waves of Irish immigrants coming in from the famine years. They came off the ships loaded with disease, and they didn't want to take them into the harbor, so they isolated some of them, makeshift mm-hmm. hospitals, and they died and were buried there. So there's two different generations of grave sites there, but separated by two, three hundred years. So wow. it's, it's going to be another haunted site. <laughs> And related to King Philip's War. Have you already gone out to Deer Island, or is that in the yes, I have, yeah. And it, so it, what did you see out of Deer Island? Anything really fascinating? That it, It's an interesting site. It's a beautiful little island. They mm-hmm. have a memorial to the Irish, but they have nothing for the Wampanoag Wars. Really? Nothing, not a mention. Huh. And they only put up the Irish site about four years ago. But there are reports of voices being heard out there. I've, we've never encountered anything. I've, I've been there twice. But they're both in the daytime, not that that matters. Spirits come day or night, but we'll have to try it at night sometimes, see if we get different results. I, I didn't realize that there were the two grave sites out there. Yeah, mass graves. I knew it as having, you know, the, the big eggs. It's the, you know, stay away from Deer Island. It stinks, and there's big yeah, eggs. it still does. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I had no idea, and that's... And it's interesting because it is, you know, if you look at the the way Boston Harbor is set up, you know, it seems like Winthrop is really far away from the South Shore and far away from where um, where West Augusta is and where all of that would have taken place. But if you go right across the water, it's it's a really short trip. It's only a long trip to us now because we have to drive through Boston. When you're in Boston, you're an hour from Boston. So. Even shorter by boat, probably go from Plymouth down to all the way to Cape Cod. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, Barry, in addition to all this rich history, you also have brought with you tonight some very spooky EVPs. Is that right? I got that. Yep. Awesome. Have you played any of them yet? I have not. We have been waiting. We wanted to be like, we wanted real, what's the word I'm looking for? Expert authentic opinion. reactions. <laughs> authentic reactions. That's what we wanted. We wanted authentic reactions. So, okay. okay. So let's play. Do you want to um, tell us what it is first and then listen? Or do you want us to listen and then you tell us about it? Okay. We'll play. We'll, uh, I'll let you know where we recorded them. Uh, and then maybe you could play the EVP and then we can talk about what we think we caught. Okay. If okay. you do them in order, uh, number one uh, was taken at Smith's Castle, which we mentioned as part of this, uh, this violent history. All right. So let's want to play number one if you could. All right. I heard it. Make out a word there? Mm -hmm. I heard it. It said, oh, God. Yeah, that's what I'm getting. Okay, one more time. One more time, Beth. I definitely hear a whisper that sounds like, oh, God. Yeah. So Smith's Castle has all kinds of activity. They've seen everything there. They've seen full body apparitions. uh, We get footsteps. We get voices. They host paranormal tours. They have two or three of them every summer. And... uh, 
We did get that. We had got that that night. And there might have been a couple others. Let's, let's get the list. Go to number, if you go to number seven, that was also Smith's Castle. We're out near the mass grave site in the backyard. The music is being played by a, a corporeal person. <laughs> He's, uh, okay. I was like, is that, is that the music? No, they were trying to set the mood, so they were using okay. American instruments. Really? Okay, hang on. Let's play this one again. Yeah, let's do it again. We're, li we're listening for some music. No, we're not listening for the music. Wait, what? We're not listening. The, the, no, we're not listening for the music. Oh, I thought the music was... No, that's a human being playing an instrument. Oh, okay. We're out near the mass grave site in the backyard. Is it the woman whispering? Yeah, right before the music starts playing, it's a woman whispering. Yeah. I can't make out what she's saying. Could you? Yeah, this would be like a class C EVP where you can't really make out the words. You can, you can hear a voice, you know, someone is there, but you can't make out what they're saying. We're right at the site where 40 soldiers are buried. Wow. Yeah. And on that site, someone's actually drawn and quartered, the only person on American land to be wow. like that. Yeah, he was, they considered him a traitor because he married into the Narragansett tribe. When King Folk's War broke out, he took the side of the Narragansett. So they killed him. <laughs> In, In a really terrible way. Oh my gosh. Horrifying. Yeah. Wait, is that true? It's the only one on American land? That's what they told us at the site. Oh. Yeah, drawn, the only one drawn and quartered, I think. Okay, so what is next? Uh, let's go to number two. And where did this take place? The Pain House Museum. That's it there. That one was pretty clear, actually. Yes. With the words. Uh, Beth, can you play that one more time? Maybe start it in the middle. That's it there. I heard I'm here. I'm is that, here. What, is what, is I that what you hear? Either I'm over here or come over here. We were on the second floor of the Payne Museum. That's that's uh, Ken DeCosta's voice. At first. He's uh, from Rise Up Paranormal. They host the investigations there. So he had said, I'm, I'm a little hard of hearing. Can you speak up? And about an eight-second wait, and then you hear the whispered, I'm over here, <laughs> from the other side of the room. My recorder was in the corner where Ken was standing, so I caught it. Uh, he got it on his, too. It came up pretty good on both. That's incredible. I, uh, I have to say, it sounded to me like an old man getting out of a chair, just going like, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it was, but, but it was a ghost of an old man. <laughs> uh, right. <laughs> All right. Hey, Which so one's next? Three also from the Payne Museum? Also, same evening at the Payne House Museum. Okay. The investigators talk. Near the piano? Mm hmm No piano. <laughs> wow. We had a team on each floor. We had walkie-talkies. Anyone? No piano. Yeah, there's one here, but we're looking at it. There's no one playing it. But they heard it, too. They caught it on their recorders. All three of us got piano playing. Oh, my gosh. Beth, play that one more time. That's incredible. Yeah. That's a good one. That's a really good get. That's okay. a really good one. Now, before you play the next one, the spirit they've seen the most at Payne House is a little girl. And Ken himself has seen 
seeing a full-bodied apparition. Some of the visitors that have done the investigations there have seen her. They have other voices, too. They've got all kinds of uh, phenomena there. But they named her Sarah. One of the mediums came up with that name. They were trying to reach out to her. She's very friendly. She's She loves when people come to visit. And Ken seems to have a relationship with her. He can get her to play tricks on people and everything. So That's at fine. the end of the night, we were doing a spirit box session. And one of the girls was speaking to Sarah. Now, this one's real subtle. You can't, You really need headphones to hear it. So if you could crank the volume all the way up, it uh, might help a little bit. It's number four. So are any of your toys here from when you lived here? It was there, Jerry. Yeah, it's subtle. It's very subtle, but it, she says yes. Yeah, that's what I'm hearing. Yes. With headphones, you can really hear it. Yeah, I, I literally have people at home can't see me, but I have my headphones like squished into my ears right now. Beth, could you play it one more time? Mm -hmm. So are any of your toys here from when you lived here? Heard better the first time. <laughs> definitely yes. Yes. Yeah, I was definitely there. So that, we think that's probably Sarah. I would say so. Okay, so what are we looking at for number five? Where's this one? Uh, this is a good one. Okay, this is the Byfield Community Arts Center um, up in Byfield, Mass. We, we have an ongoing investigation going there. It was built in 1905 as a meeting house. It never served as a town hall. No one ever lived there. But uh, two people have seen a full-body apparition of a woman dressed in colonial costume. One of them we spoke to directly, she was one of the historians, led us into the building for the evening. She said that she was standing just outside the door to the entrance, and she saw the woman standing there. She smiled at her and actually reached up to touch her cheek before she disappeared. So she's quite friendly. Uh, we, we've been there seven or eight times, and we're going back there in a couple of weeks. We've gotten... Um, Mostly knocking sounds, we heard vibrations, the REM pods go off, the motion sensors go off. And we've got a few voices. We even had a voice uh, cursing us out one night. <laughs> Ooh, that's fun. <laughs> okay, let's hear it. So again, uh, could you tell us your name, please? Um, it's the car's outside. No, it was a stink woman's humming. You can hear us discussing it. We thought it might be a car going by, and Christina said, "No, no, that was a woman's voice." Let's go Did back and hear it one more time. You hear it. I'll try oh, yeah. not to. I'll try not to gasp when I hear it this time. So again, uh, could you tell us your name, please? Okay. Let's hear it, huh? Yeah. I, you can hear Naomi very. That's very what I clearly. Yeah. Very Most clearly. Of, that's the name, yeah. Spooky. I wonder if it's the same spirit that people have seen. Yeah. Very, very direct. Okay, so what is six? Number six, um, Lakeville State Hospital. Uh, they're going to be closing that down and, and putting up a, a food processing plant down there. So we end up being able to get down there and investigate. It was mostly for um, emphysema and uh, it wasn't a mental insane sound. It was mostly just a basic hospital, normal hospital. But people that have been there have heard voices. We didn't get any EVPs, but this one did seem to respond. We were in one area. We were in the boiler room in the basement. And we got a response almost two or three times right away when we asked for a reaction. And while we were there, Michelle had felt... Chills, felt a vibration. I, I suddenly felt chilled to the bone. I mentioned it to her, and she said, yeah, she pointed right to the same spot where I felt it. So that's where I felt it, too. So we concentrated on that area. We tried a couple of spirit box sessions, didn't get anything. But the EVPs, it was mostly do a noise that sounds like maybe a door opening or something scraping, but it, it was in reaction to our requesting it to make a noise. So play number six, would you? Can you make another noise for us? 
Maybe give us a tour of the building, tell us where to go. Right I, I didn't that one I didn't catch. Hold on, yeah. let's let's do it again. Can you make another noise for us? Maybe give us a tour of the building, tell us where to go. I definitely heard it that time. Yeah. It's a scraping sound, but mm -hmm. it, it was kind of loud live. We heard it live. It sounds like a, a door open. door opening or a chair coming across the floor. Oh. Can we try it one more time? I, I, I'm not hearing anything. I, I've, I've been having a little trouble hearing, really, but I'm really not hearing this. Can you make another noise for us? Maybe give us a tour of the building, tell us where to go? She <laughs> says, tell us where to go, and then there's a pause, and then you hear... Mm. Yeah. I don't know. I, I'm sure, if you guys hear it, I'm sure everyone else will hear it, too. She's not registering for me. You want to try yeah. one, once more? No, yeah, sorry. Okay, all right. So, so then we talked about Smith, and is this the same screech owl? No, yeah, at West I guess it. Let's listen to it one more time, just because it's creepy and I like it. Do you start screaming in the in this recording? No. Oh, we got the thermal camera. Oh. Maybe we can get it. <laughs> That'd be awesome. David, are you still here? I got a lot of spirits. That is creepy, man. <laughs> we didn't Great know it was owl a, sounds. No idea what it was. Me and Christina are like looking at each other, like, "What is that? <laughs> what is that?" <laughs> if you hadn't said that it it came over and it showed up like right on top of you, I would have said, "You know, did you yell at the houses around you to stop that?" <laughs> Just one of the one of the people that live right around there, maybe just making owl noises one night. But if you said it came over like right with you, then then it clearly wasn't just somebody standing on their back porch making owl noises. Maybe we were approaching its nest, and you know, it's protecting its young. Maybe. No, I think it was a spirit. I mean, how often do you see an owl in the wild? I, I don't think I've seen one in my entire life, and only from you know three hundred yards away. I saw my very first one on my honeymoon last year in Hawaii. That was the first time. And then I saw another one two months later in the parking lot in Norwell, um, the TJ Maxx Big Y parking lot, which would be like maybe like five miles from here. But I, I've heard them here and there. And like when I lived in Weymouth, I lived down in Bird Sanctuary and I could hear an owl at night. But you never really see them. Like, they're not around. And that was like an owl that was just like, hoo, 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 like your classic owl. So this was, it was spooky. And it's, it's right when we're, we we're doing this. I, I just, I can't believe it wasn't a message. I mean, it may have been. I've seen some crazy things since I got into this business. So my mind is open to anything. Could very well be the spirit of a Native American. I mean, that's mm -hmm. what they believe. Yeah. Or, it's, uh, or it could be an owl. <laughs> 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 You know, it's so funny. You know, um, Amelia's mom was always a, a bird fan. And so that it, pretty much everyone in the family is like bird, bird people. And my husband is a bird person and we'll be driving along and he's like, Oh, look at that out. Like, I don't understand where these people see birds. I have never once been driving along and been like, Ooh, look at that <laughs> and named some sort of random bird in the sky. <laughs> I do it. I do it all the time, and it drives my husband. He's like fascinated by it. He he has like the bad thing, which is like, how are you seeing all these birds everywhere? Right. I'm like, I grew up with it. Both my like, parents are birders. Keep your eyes on the road. <laughs> <laughs> Stop looking at the birds at the top of the trees. My safety is at stake here. <laughs> Not driving. She can look at all the birds she wants. <laughs> yeah, I just got um, I got a new pair of. Well, I shouldn't say a new pair. My first pair of binoculars recently. So this spring, I plan on doing a lot of very interesting bird watching. So I'm very excited. And so, your new house is at a really great place for lots of wildlife and birds. And I'm sure you're um, going to have lots of them in your yard. Unfortunately, I do have a red-tailed hawk that lives immediately across the street from me. I see her every day. Um, but that means I can't have chickens, which is kind of sad. It's yeah. actually yeah. one of the EVPs, Amelia, the... Uh, Number two, the whisper at Smith's Castle. There's actually you can actually hear an owl before you hear the whisper. <laughs> Just one little hoot. 
Do it again. Do it again. Play number two again. Two, yeah. We're out near the mass grave site in the backyard. Good. Yes. 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 Early. It's early. I missed it. He oh. says mass grave site, and as he's saying site, it starts doing. We're out near the mass grave site in the backyard. Oh, Good. I did hear. Yeah. They're following me. <laughs> Well, but that was a different kind of owl. This was just like a whoo. Um, yeah, that was a normal owl. Whoo. Well, wasn't that also at a Native American site? Yeah, they believe all owls have mystical properties. Well, that's because oh, owls yeah. are awesome. Yeah, they do. Owls are awesome. They have those amazing eyes. And they can turn their heads all the way around. Yeah, yeah. like Linda Blair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I don't think they're necessarily Linda Blair type, but um, I just think that they're very cool and they, they can look at you when you're behind them. <laughs> just flip their head around and just look you right in the eye. Very, very cool. So, Barry, what do you, what's coming up for you guys? What investigations do you have on the horizon? Well, I mentioned we're going back to Byfield in a couple of weeks. After that, we've got in April, we've got um, the S.K. Pierce Mansion in Gardner, Mass. Which we are tagging along for. Joining us, hopefully, in... Um, has a great history of hauntings, a number of deaths. It used to be a, a seedy boarding house. All kinds of weird things happened there. I actually um, read slash listen, listened to the Bones in the Basement book about the S.K. Pierce um, house, and it was fascinating, absolutely fascinating. So Perfect. I'm I'm really looking forward to going. Definitely on my bucket list. <clears throat> Uh, what else we got? The USS Salem, the um, submarine in Quincy, which is known to be haunted by spirits. They had done a rescue mission down in um, Greece, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, and people that they brought on board died from their, their wounds and their injuries. So they still roam the ship. The, I saw a full-body apparition there. Good. Yep. When we went. Um we, uh, with Don DeCristofaro and his gang at uh, Greater Boston Paranormal Associates, me, Beth, my brother, and my brother's friend Jessica, we all went. And we weren't getting a lot. And then I, like, went off to go to the bathroom, and I, like, looked down a hall, and there was a man standing right there. I was like, ah! oh, <laughs> What? Full body apparition is the holy grail for ghosts. Uh, yeah, it was. It was like a split second, and like I, I had my recorder out. I was recording all I did, and all of a sudden, you can like hear me like speed up. And this woman, I believe her name was Eva, is behind me. And she's like, "Are you okay?" And I'm like, "I just saw a ghost," <laughs> which is what you want. But it like it totally threw me off. Yeah, it's what you want, but it's a little scary when it actually happens. Yeah, yeah you're prepared, but you don't know how you're gonna react till you're there. Mm hmm. Well, that's awesome. Those are all great spots. And if people want to get in touch with you, if they want to go on a ghost hunt with BPI, or if they just have questions, if they have a house that's haunted that they need you to investigate, how can people find you? We have a, a request for help form on our website, bostonparanormal.net. And there's other kinds of evidence posted there, the pictures and EVPs. And uh, we also have a Facebook page. It's called Boston Paranormal Investigators. You can look us up there. And that's the two best ways to reach us. But uh, if you need help, we certainly will come out to help you out. Use the request form. We'll, we'll send out someone to interview you and get an investigator out to help you. Well, great. Barry, you got any other businesses that you might like to give a plug to? Any, you know, cats you're, uh, you're having we, fun with these days? I have a comic strip about cats Beth is referring to. It's um, actually... A, uh, cartoonist and I have a free newsletter. I don't know if you guys heard about that. It's called Two Fisted Tales. If you want to get on the mailing list, just go to my website. It's uh, CorbettFeatures.com and there's a link to my email to get on the web the uh, mailing list. It's free. It's in PDF form once a month. Very cool. And it's not just cat comics. Panel cartoons. Um, another one called A League of Evil Mad Scientists and we also have done some memoirs, a graphic novel called Terminal Velocity, and uh, I just don't know where I'm at. I'm all over the place. <laughs> you're, you're creating, and and that's amazing. Thanks. I do. I, I do enjoy the comics. I don't know that I've ever seen a full-body apparition of a ghost, but I have seen a full cat apparition. You have? I have. This random, um, it, it was a random black cat. It just 
was in my kitchen one day. I looked down. It, I saw out of the corner of my eye a cat standing at my back door waiting to go out. And I looked over, and it was not either of my cats. It was a black cat, and it was looking at me, and then it just disappeared. Remember oh. me telling you about that, Amelia? It was, it mm-hmm. was crazy. Ghost cat. Yeah. I Hammond. haven't seen, I haven't seen it since, but. Hammond Castle in, um, where is it? Ipswich? It's in Gloucester. It, it's mm-hmm. wanted by cats. People that visit there feel them moving up against their shins and, yeah. I would Quite agree a, that. Pat, all the ghost cats. I'm not a crazy cat lady, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> I might give the impression that I am, but I'm really not. <laughs> I just really like my cat. <laughs> so oh, very cool. So Barry, thank you so much for coming on with us tonight. Um, this has been so fun and for bringing your wealth of history and for bringing EVPs and for putting up with me when I get scared of owls late at night <laughs> in the middle of the woods. <laughs> Not in the middle of the woods, Amelia. Just in the little park right off the street. <laughs> <laughs> and we're so looking forward to going to SK Pierce with you guys and um, talking to you again in the future. So thanks for sticking with us. Thank you. It was great to see you both. Appreciate you it. That Wasn't was that- really great. That was so fun. Barry's always so cool. And we're so blessed to have him in our circle. Mm-hmm. As as one of our original uh, impetuses to go and do some ghost hunting. Yeah. Yep. And very cool. Very cool of him to come and take the time to to talk with us and just bringing, bringing all that great stuff for us. So thanks, Barry. Yeah. Thanks, Barry. And everyone, be sure to go follow Boston Paranormal Investigators on their Facebook group or at bostonparanormalinvestigators.com and go check out Barry and his comics at CorbettFeatures.com. They're good. They're cool. I throw them in our story sometimes for the Ghost Hunting in New England Instagram. So you've probably seen them there. You follow us on social media. I like them. They're fun. Yeah. So if you were wondering where those comics come from, that's the man. Do you got anything else tonight, Beth? I have nothing else. Do we have any emails? Nope. Do we have any reviews? Nope. Do we have any drive-by ghosting? Nope. This is like our third episode, fourth episode this season. We have no drive-by ghostings. No drive-by ghostings, people. Also, I spent some time today trying to figure out how to get in touch with Stephen King, and I, like, came up empty, like, completely empty. Oh. Yeah, I'm kind of, I'm like, "Hmm, I don't know how that happened, so. I'm going to keep working on it, though. Folks, you keep working on it, too. We need to manifest it. We're recording tonight on the Leo full moon, which is a great full moon for manifesting love, finances, and career things. So I think we can do it. Love. Beth, I was trying to think of this earlier today. Do you have any Leo in your chart? Me? Yeah. I have no idea. You know who would know? No. You would. Didn't don't you have a copy of my chart? No, I don't. Oh. <laughs> I was trying to think back to when um Tim gave you the astrology reading a year ago, and I was trying to remember if there was any Leo and I didn't I don't think there was. I have no idea. <laughs> Uh, I remember he said that I am, my chart was of somebody who, um, when I'm uncomfortable about things, I make bad jokes. Yep. Yep. That was the main thing that I took away from my chart. <laughs> uh, should, I, should I have taken something else? No, that's a fine thing to take away. Okay. So I guess that's it for tonight. Thank you, spooky friends, for staying along with us. And be sure to reach out to us online. At, do you have something yeah, else you want to say? Sending us emails and drive-by ghostings. We haven't had any drive-by ghostings yet this year. So basically a drive-by ghosting is just you getting your chance to tell your ghost story that you've always wanted to tell. We believe your stories. Send them to us. We share them with everybody. Send them along. I'm sorry. Continuing on with the contact information. You can find us online at ghosthuntinginnewengland.com. You can also submit your drive-by ghostings through there. Or you can send them to us directly at ghosthuntinginnewengland at gmail.com. You can find us on Instagram at ghosthuntinginnewengland. We are very close to 2,000 Instagram followers. So hopefully that will happen by our next episode. Or on Twitter at ghosthuntingne. And on Facebook at facebook.com backslash ghosthuntinginnewengland. As always, you can send a carrier pigeon over to Pancake's house. And as always, when you're in, when you're in a restaurant, don't help yourself to the stuff at the wait station. Please keep your dirty hands off of what could possibly be my napkin in the future. Thank you. Does this happen to you a lot? 
listen, I don't know where you go to eat. Why don't you see these things happening? I don't know where you go to eat. I go lots of places and I see people do very strange things. And remember, I'm very old and I've been eating out for a long time. So it's not like these things have happened to me this week. Oh my God, Beth, 25 isn't old for the last time. Jeez. I know, right? But I, I've eaten out enough for, you know, like a 40 something year old. And as always, happy hunting.